Welcome to Inspired Changemakers, a podcast about all the amazing things people are doing to make the world a better place. This podcast is about creating change and the moments that inspired our guests to activate. My name is Julia Healy, and I'm the CEO of United Charitable. Stay tuned to be inspired. Hey, Tina, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. I'm so super excited. You are definitely an inspired change maker. And this podcast really is talking about how not only can we change ourselves, but how do we change the world? And I am so excited to talk to you about all the things that you have accomplished thus far and all the things you want to accomplish. So let me do your background, right? Your bio. Tina is the founder and executive director of the I'm Just Me movement, a nonprofit 501c3 organization and a councilwoman for Stephen City Town Council. Tina is a trained trauma-informed practitioner, certified peer recovery specialist, and forensic peer recovery specialist supervisor. I can't wait till you defined all the different (laughs) things and what that means. Um, Tina's experience with facing adversity and barriers have instilled a deep sense of commitment to making a difference in her community for her children, adults, and families through the IJMM Live Life Forward programs. I know a mouthful, right? <laughs> I mean, are, do you think you have enough specialist titles in your... <laughs> I will tell you that for anybody out there, I never wanted any like letters behind my name. Like I was always intimidated by people that had letters. I'm like, oh, they've got all these letters. Right. Know, I don't have these letters. But um, as life would have it and some of the things that um, you know, I, I've been able to do through sharing my, my story of a child uh, that went through childhood trauma and made it through the other side of that and through inspiring my story uh, led me to people wanting me to um, you know, share more and say more. And so um, there's a specific craft to telling your story. And as I begin to dive into those, uh, I realized that there was some power in that, right? There's some power in me telling my story. No one else can tell my story like me. And so I dived into some additional training. And so um, there's a whole movement across Virginia. It's called Peer Support. And it's a non-clinical approach to helping people on their journey to wellness, whether that's childhood trauma, um, addiction, mental health challenges, challenges. And so, you know, I was intrigued by how my story was powerful, but even more intrigued that I could become trained and uh, be able to have that as a career to help others. So yeah, let's start from the beginning. Where were you born? Alexandria, Virginia. Woo, woo. <laughs> so you're a local. So you've just kind of stayed here your your whole life. I have. Uh, Alexandria, Virginia is where I was born, and then my mom took a job uh, when Reston Hospital relocated to Reston. So then we kind of migrated to Reston with her job, and, uh, you know, I'm sure we'll get into some of the other things later, but uh, I eventually found myself in Winchester um, when we adopted a sibling group of uh, children from Fairfax County Foster Care and Adoption. That's amazing. So we met... Um, actually through what Jonathan, right? We met through Jonathan Mm -hmm. and you were, I mean, I think the league was just starting, right? So tell me a little bit about the Valley Vipers. Okay. So, uh, the basketball league has been started about seven years. Uh, we are now uh, going into our third season. So the Virginia Valley Vipers, um, long story short, um, my son played for, uh, the Admirals, which was in New York. Uh, we supported the team and then we were presented with the opportunity to become investors. So at first we're like, no, you know, we just want to support the team, but we started to go to games and see how people in the community were coming together for their hometown team. Long story short, uh, at the end of the season, his goal was to come to Virginia and, you know, relocate. And so we're like, yeah, come on over. Well, you know, and so at that time we would have been the admirals. Um, But as life would have it, uh, we, um, he got a promotion and he was expecting a baby. And so he is still the admirals. He is still in, uh, he's in New Jersey. And uh, we pursued our, our, our uh, dreams to be able to start a pro team right here in Virginia. So uh, we came up with a name. We did some marketing, uh, put together a, a, a three-year plan that would help us kind of have that footprint on how we can be a successful business. Um, we reached out to the community, got their thoughts. We went to politicians and people in the community and said, hey, you know, 
we are the Virginia Valley Vipers, and if we can secure Shenandoah University as our home court, then this is where we'll be. And so um, we uh, started about uh, three years ago, and uh, this is our third season. It's awesome. But you guys are now playing in Percyville, right? You've moved from Winchester or Shenandoah University to Patrick Henry College. We did. So we've expanded our market footprint, um, and, you know, this is the perfect time to do it. You know, we were really excited about uh, being able to have our home at Patrick Henry College, and they've been very welcoming and open to it, and, you know, so... You know, again, you know, we want to be where we're wanted and we want to be where we can be successful. And um, the community of Percival is actually a sports enthusiast town. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> Woo-hoo! Um, what I think is really great, too, about, you know, each of your basketball games and how many games are there in a season? 24. You support a different nonprofit almost every game. We do. We got 12 home games and 12 away games. And uh, this year we'll be supporting Tree of Life uh, Ministries. And at each of our games, we're going to collect food. And those foods will will be uh, distributed to families that are facing food insecurities. What made you want to add the philanthropy into the business? Uh, The philanthropy? The philanthropic efforts kind of came baked into the cake. So from our leadership all the way down. So uh, Mr. and Mrs. Magley, uh, they are our leaders. Uh, They are uh, the president and then the founder. And, um, you know, it's built in the mission and the vision of the basketball Mm -hmm. league. Each each of uh, the teams have their own kind of uh, charity of choice and um, ways that they can uh, support their communities. And really, it's about loving on the community. And it's already baked in the cake. It came down to us. And, uh, you know, we are fulfilling that mission. Uh, you can't you can't have all the fun. You got to give back as well. Oh, I love that. And then so really, and you get and your son's on the team, right? He is on the team. Yep. And so tell me a little bit about him because I know he inspires you a lot. Um, he's on the team. He's a player. He's also a team market owner. Uh, when we made the decision that we would start this team, we wanted to make sure that we could help guys like RJ and around the community and in the country because we have people that have reached out to us from Ghana and different countries saying, hey, you know, we've heard about the Virginia Valley Vipers. We want an opportunity to play in the U.S. Um, but this is, an, this is an opportunity for young men to play the sport that they love, but to also give back. So he happens to be a team market owner, but he is still a player and he's in different roles. Um, But um, he inspires me because he represents what you can do at uh, this level, you know, being able to go to, he has two degrees. He's had some uh, challenges himself in terms of, um, you know, gaining his, um, bachelor's degree and having a special style of learning and, you know, with a a student with a learning disability and having to kind of share with the world, you know, before he went to college, he said, you know, my whole life I've been hiding the fact that I have this learning disability and people will never know who I truly am if I don't share my story now. And so at 18 years old, he found himself going on TV to share with the local uh, TV station that, um, Up to that point, he was known as the shy basketball player, and they called him the quiet storm. Um, And um, it's kind of inspiring to see him share his story and have those challenges, but also go to college and advocate for those special plans that he needed to obtain his degree. And so um, I think he represents, um, you know, many people that have challenges and they have to overcome and find a way to advocate. And so, um, and now he is an entrepreneur in the fact that he owns part of the team, right? He's a team market owner. Yeah. And he still gets to play the game he loves. And he's a nonprofit founder. So the nonprofit turned 11 years old this year. It's a nonprofit that he started. It's called I'm just me movement. Right. At the end of his interview, uh, when he was 18 and telling his story, he said, now I can just be me. So we're like, how do we encourage other people to be just who they are? Right. Show up in the world as their authentic selves. Um, so we became, uh, you know, uh, we were a fundraiser and then we became a nonprofit. And then now we're a nonprofit 501c3 organization that provides um, supportive uh, supports for youth and families and sharing our, our lived experiences. And he mentors young men and there's a whole kind of um, 
connection that he has with with kids and uh, so his his degree is in sports ma- marketing uh, with a concentration on youth development and being able to see him do that you know it's more than basketball i'd like to thank united charitable for sponsoring today's inspire changemakers podcast united charitable is a national nonprofit that focuses on guiding you on your charitable journey whether you like to simply streamline your giving or you like to create your own charitable initiative united charitable has the knowledge and resources to support you if you'd like to learn more check out the link in our bio right and so now tell me a little bit about the councilwoman. So when did, so I kind of, you know, we, we started about where you were born. So tell me a little bit about your journey and then how did the journey lead to councilwoman? Okay. So I'm an advocate by nature. <laughs> so we're, you know, since young, 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 I've learned that if I'm going to have a voice, I need to assert myself. If I'm going to have need, basic needs met, food, security, things like that, like I have to use my voice. And um, once my, once, uh, my mom relocated to Alexandria and then we, um, later in life, Rodney and I adopted the sibling group of children, it took us to Winchester. From Winchester, I mean, our kids are 30 and, you know, 30 and up, I'll say. Right. Um, and Rodney and I have been, re- 33 years we've been, we've been together. 30. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but I say all that to say, so once our lives um, brought us to Winchester, now all of the kids at, at one point have you know, they're all adulting. We have three grandkids. We're like, okay, we don't need this big three-level family-sized home. Right. We need to downsize. So we started to look in the area to see what was available. And one day Rodney came and he's like, oh, I see this beautiful town home. I see this beautiful town home. I think it's perfect for us. We should go see it. Let's go tour it. And I was like, well, I don't know if we're quite ready to leave right now. And he's like, yeah, but it's available. So long story short, called up the realtor, uh, viewed the home, toured the home. He's like, this is this is our new home. So we moved from the Winchester area to Stephen City. While I was there, probably about um, three months or so, there was an election that was coming up. And so everybody's like, Tina, like, they need someone on council. You know, they're, the lady that's there now, um, she's actually going to take a job. And um, she's not she's not going to be on council anymore. And I'm like, what? And so, long story short, they're like, well, you have to do it. And I'm like, why me? And I'm like, well, you're the, you're the one. And I'm like, okay, let's, let's look at other options. You know, if nobody else steps up, then fine. Okay, I'll do it. Like, but in my brain, I'm thinking chances are somebody else is going to step right. up. Like, right. you know, so uh, that didn't happen. And uh, I found myself uh, being approached again and just saying, hey, you've got what it takes. You care about the community. You're connected to the community. Um, and we want you to run. And I'm like, but I don't have. So, again, trying to get out of it. I don't have a campaign manager. Like, there's so much involved in this. Right. Like, how could this, like, right. You know. So, and they're like, oh, well, we have a campaign manager, and we've got somebody that will help you. And I was like, all right, all right, okay, okay. I'll I'll, I'll fill out the application. Right. <laughs> so, fill out the application. Um, and, you know, I I put in my bid for running, and uh, I I won. I was expected to lose, and I won uh, by six, more than 60% of the votes, and let's uh, go. I know. First African American woman to ever run and win a seat on city council. Congratulations. Yep, in Stephen City. There you go. I knocked on every door. Did you really? Oh, I still have the shoes to show it. I've got like holes in the bottom of my shoes. <laughs> I knocked on every single door. We made a plan. We put but see some of those things that we do in our philanthropic worlds of things as moms, as cheerleaders, as all of the things, right? Can be kind of folded in to you know the political world of things and I never saw myself as a politician but I've always seen myself as wanting to advocate for what's right and wanting to you know but isn't that funny because you can we were talking about this kind of before the podcast but we can see ourselves as people that advocate right or people that create change or people that lead 
But then to actually give us the title of like, for me, CEO or councilwoman, that seems daunting, right? But all of that it takes to be those things, we already do, Mm -hmm. right? But then to actually give the title, that's what causes pause, right? When you're like, wait, but... Okay, I'll just, like you, just like you said, you'll do, well, I'll just fill out the application. And I'm not going to win, guys. Like, I'm not, and now you won by 60% of the vote, like, and, you know. But that's what it, but that's what it is to create change. So tell me a little bit about, you know, why then all the trauma, why was that called to you? Like, why do you feel very called to do that, that work? Well, the trauma work is important to me because I was a kid that grew up in some very hard times. My uh, mom, well, at that point, uh, by eight years old, my dad had died of a drug overdose. My mom was raising three children, three girls at that. She was doing everything that she could to provide um, basic things that we that we needed. And as a result, she started to deal with my dad's death in her own way, and she turned to alcohol as a way to um, to deal and to cope. And so it put us in some very um, precarious situations, um, and three girls, you know, and so, and we were always taught, you don't tell what happens in here, you know, we, what happens here stays here, and we hear that right. all the time, but it's a true, it's a true statement, and part of that was maybe embarrassment or she didn't want people to know that she wasn't able to provide some of the things that we needed. But um, long story short, uh, a a mentor, a mentor. um, I went to school, you know, and she said, you know, what's happening today? You know, you look a little down and I'm like, you know, again, don't talk about it. It's our family secret. Like nobody needs to know. But she just so genuinely said to me, Like, I don't know what's happening. Was this a counselor at school? She was a teacher. A teacher. Okay. And and what high school? Um, Alexandria was at Alexandria. And she said, she looked me like in my eyes and she said, I don't know what's happening. I just want you to know that I care. And what grade were you in? I was 15 and pregnant at that point. Yep. So all of the things we had dealt with, we had learned how to cope. We didn't tell our secrets. We made through on life. My mom did the best she could. And still, we're like, we got to stay together. At the end of each day, my sisters and I would say, we just got to come back and see each other at the end of the day. If anybody asks if we have food, yes. If they ask if we're safe, yes. Because those are the key words that schools look for, you know. So it's like, yes, yes. Even when we didn't, we said yes. And so... um, I found myself in this situation, fast forward as a teen mom and saying, I just found out I'm pregnant and chances are, you know, six months from now, I'm not going to be able to hide this secret. Like, this is very concerning. And and growing up at 15, you know, they said, you'll be 15 and pregnant, you'll drop out. And so I had so much on my shoulders that day, just the day before finding out I'm pregnant and now having to go to school and her just saying, like, I care. And then something in me just said, just tell her. You're, you're not going to be able to hide this in six months. Right. And so, and how did she handle it and how did she help? So, it was the opposite of what I thought. Like I said, a teenage mom, so many labels on you, right? And right. Section 8 housing. Um, and she said, I said, well, you know, you want to know? Okay, here you go. Here you are. And basically, like, I'm just going to give it to you. This right. is everything I got. Everything right. from eight years old. Everything I wanted to say. Everything yeah. I couldn't say. So I just said, I'm 15 and I'm pregnant. And I'm probably going to drop out of school. And I'm probably not going to graduate. And I'm probably going to maybe die of a drug overdose myself. Or, uh, like, there were so many things that I was putting on myself because society told me that I would be those things. And so I just kind of let her have it. And she just looked at me and she's like, I was like, go ahead. I mean, she, she was right. like paused, like, like, what do I do with this, right? And I just said, go ahead. Just tell me how irresponsible I am. Right. Tell me the all judgment, the things. All of it. Right. And she was like, and I said, and she said, Tina, you're still going to graduate. And I'm like, really? Like, that's your answer? You're not going to tell me all of the, and she was like, no, I still, you can still graduate. You can still go to college. All these things that you want to do, like, and I had already talked about all the things I wanted to do when I grew right. up, right? So she had, had all that back history. Yeah. But she was like, I was like, you don't believe? And she was like, I don't believe any of these things that you're telling me. And, like, that, and it's that one person. It only takes one person. 
person to look you in the eyes and say, I care. Mm -hmm. I want to help. And she showed me. I walked across that stage. I was on track for graduation. I had my son and he has I have pictures of him in my graduation hat. And I went to college. And you know what? When I went to apply, guess who was there? My teacher, she not only said you will make, you will graduate and you will make it to college. She showed me, she took me there and I applied and I became the first, um, the first person in my family to make it, uh, to college first generation. Yeah. Okay. And where did you go? I did Northern Virginia Community College right in Sterling. So that was my first experience with college. Um, And so getting into the trauma work, it just takes me back to that feeling of saying, there's so many Tinas in the world. What if there was just one person Uh in in their lives that could look them in their eyes like my mentor did? And I wanted to be that person. So, you know, it's kind of a, a, you know, it, it's my it's my passion. It's it's in who I am, and um, and so the trauma work allows me to continue to tell my story, to heal as well, but also to help people on their journeys to know that you can overcome these things. You can end generational cycles of trauma, and it starts with just one decision. So my decision that I would not want my kids to kind of go through some of the things I did, my decision in that impacted my children my grandchildren and oh, just with just with one one generation one one decision so the trauma work is important to me um it's powerful and i've had to overcome a lot of things in my life uh and so giving back through sharing my story and providing these mental health supports for young kids and the parents because we also provide parental um classes as well because there are parents that just don't have the skills to give and that was my mom So tell me, I'm like (laughs) listening and as a mom and as a mom of two, I get just very overwhelmed in my, you know, situation. How have you juggled this as a mom? How have you been able to launch your kids into the world and develop a nonprofit and to raise a son that at 18 years old realized that his voice was so important? Like, what is your secret? Two things. One is my husband. Okay. I wouldn't be able to do anything without him. I mean, it is, I mean, we've got 33 years of growing and learning and, you know, getting along and not getting along and living life and, you know, all of these things. But, you know, I wouldn't be able to do any of that without him. And I also will say that I I believe there's a higher power that guides and helps me kind of be at center with myself and realize that, you know, I'm not alone, that I can conquer things, I can overcome things, and that even though sometimes that eight-year-old Tina shows up, you know, because, you know, let's face it, I'm not perfect. Right. But there are times when I feel inadequate. There are times when I um, need a little support myself and having a partner uh, at the end of the day that's like, listen, I got you. You're okay. Like, that makes a world of difference. So I have been with my husband. We've been married 11 years, and but together 19 years. It'll be 20 years in July of 2025. Congrats. Thanks. Um, but what I've realized is being able to tell him the crazy. That has been something that I am be, have become, I guess, now more than ever, very thankful for. Mm-hmm. Because you're right. You do have that voice or that low points where you worry about things that you necessarily don't need to worry about or like, do you know all the things that go through your head? And it's like, I tell him the crazy. And sometimes he'll just look at me and like, like that thought actually came through your head. Do you know what I mean? Like he'll just kind of look at me like, Julia, you don't think you can accomplish this? Look at everything that you've accomplished, right? Like, and it's, so it's really funny. So having that partner, having that support has really helped you become an entrepreneur right? Mm -hmm. A council city woman. Yeah. Certified and doing the work that you really believe in and running your own nonprofit. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's quite an accomplishment. And so what would you like to see the Valley Vipers give back to the community? 
Loudoun County. Oh my goodness. So we've already started hitting the ground running. Okay. The, <laughs> the moment that we found out that Patrick Henry would be our school, we were like, oh my gosh, how do we help interns here be able to you know, get in the field experience? Yeah. We've already hired our statisticians. They are students at Patrick Henry College. We found out uh, through going to the um, uh, the town office that uh, to do to acquire the paperwork, um, we found that there's a food insecurity right there in town, and there because there was a box that said Tree of Life, and I'm like on my phone Google, I'm like Tree of Life, what is that about? So I'm looking at, it, I'm like, wow, they are providing meals in the community. They they have volunteers that come to help them package me, and I'm just like, oh my God, well, like, I got to learn more about this. Yeah. So I, immediately, I was like, I got to die. So when I left that, um, the town office, I, you know, I, and actually I um, ended up learning about it from Mayor um, Alon Stanley, and he's like, yeah, Tree of Life is just, you know, right, if you go out, and I was like, okay. So in my mind, I'm thinking, little does he know, like, I'm going there right now, like, I, because I'm an actionable person, and I'm like, when I get to thought, I was just like, but that's what makes you successful because they don't just stay as thoughts. The thoughts turn into action plans, right? They do. And then you work your work plan, right? You work that action plan. Because yes. even in that, like you dropped the bomb. Yeah. I just, I talked to the mayor about what the city needs. I mean, seriously. Could you imagine if all business owners came in and went and talked to the mayor about, hey, what does this community really need? You know, like that, again, that just makes you such an inspired change maker. But seriously. Thank you. And so how many people do you want? So what is the, what can the arena hold? How many people can attend the games? So I keep hearing all the like, I don't know if they're trying to hype me up or they're just like, oh, yeah, yeah. It's such a sports town. The Cannons, which is a a baseball team, a pro team has anywhere from 700 to 1,000 attendees at their games. And we've gone there. We've yelled our brains out just this past Love season. Love it. Um, so we're, like, asking people, we're like, how, how many people do you think we'll have? So I, I was like, Patrick Henry, how many people can it hold? So we went yesterday. We mapped out, you know, how many people, where they yeah. can sit, where the suites will be. And yeah. uh, it, it can hold 700 people. So it, we could come to a point where um, people <laughs> – there's going to be a high demand for games because people are going to come in uh, and and get their seats and they may possibly run out of space. We'll have standing room only. (laughs) And the good part about that is then when you know you attend that game, you know that this, that the Valley Vipers give back. You know that it cares about its community, right? Yeah. You know that you've collected women's coats for the shell. You know, I mean, you've done mm-hmm. so many different things. Can you talk a little bit about the Kids Get In Free initiative? Oh, my gosh. Thank you very much because it's like my baby and we weren't sure it was going to work. But for two years, we've been really successful with being able to have kids attend games free so the adults pay so they come with a paying adult but kids are absolutely free we don't charge kids at all and for two years we've been able to do that we're so grateful and thankful that the thought kind of came to fruition but we wouldn't be able to do that without our sponsors like we had this wild idea took it and ran with it it was successful for two years so we're like yay wonderful we want to continue that we're going into our third year here um as an organization and thankfully uh united charitable thank you guys i'm going to do a shameless plug here because you guys were the very first um entity that reached out and said hey you guys have this kids initiative we want to be a part of that what what does that look like what do we what can we do I would like to thank Athletes Charitable for sponsoring today's Inspired Changemakers podcast. Athletes Charitable offers a concierge membership service that provides the tools and resources to build a legacy through service. Our athlete-led team has the first-hand experience and expertise to provide hands-on support that simplifies the entire process for athletes and entertainers to reach their social entrepreneurship goals and create lasting impact in their communities. To learn more, check out the link in the bio. Because my big thing, and, and you, if you've listened to the podcast at all or whatnot, my big thing is I really think if you show somebody what their life could be or what they could accomplish, it opens their mind, right? And so now you're showing kids that they could make the NBA, but there's also other places where they can still play and live their passion and be part of a team. And I've talked to a lot of sports players over the years, right? And the number one thing I hear that they miss, they miss playing, 
but they also miss the camaraderie. They miss getting on the bus, right? They miss like the, the, what is it? The music, the hype music that you play, right? Like the hype music that you play. Yeah. The connection, being on the same team with somebody, working with somebody. And it's all these things that sports really gives you the capability of doing. So the fact that now you are getting to open people or especially kids' minds that this is a possibility for them and they can see people. And um, from what I know of your players, they go and they kiss all the babies, they right? Do. They, they They slap all the hands, <laughs> yes, right? They, they sign all the autographs. And it, they really connect with their community. And I think in this day and age that that connection and that community is so important. Mm-hmm. And I'm actually really proud of Loudon Sports because not only do you have now the Virginia Valley Vipers, right? But you also have the Cannons and you have to have Loudon United. Yes. And, and I've participated in and brought my kids to a lot of those events. And it has just been really fun to be able to see people living their passion. I love that. And we've gone to games too. We just recently went to a Loudon United game, yelled their brains out. I was like, ah! Right? They were down zero to one. And then they came out and were like, but I'm yelling like, yeah. Right. I'm so excited. Um, But you're right. Sports has a very unique way of connecting people. And I know right now we're in the middle of an election year and things get tense and crazy sometimes. But sports is a uniter, no matter what political affiliation, no matter what genre, genre, no matter what age you are. Sports really has a way of connecting people. And, you know, growing up, I'm a diehard Philadelphia Eagles fan and Philadelphia Phillies fan. And growing up, you know, I will say there was a really difficult point in my parents' marriage, but we had season tickets to the Eagles. And I, I, like, I knew my parents were getting divorced, like, when I went away to college. Like, so there was, like, you know, a couple of years there where it was just not the most pleasant. But we would go to those games and I would be so thankful that the Eagles were playing because I knew that whole card right there. We were all going to be on the same team. We were all going to be cheering for the Eagles. My parents would have the best time discussing whatever was going on, right? Like, you know, Donovan McNabb, whatever was going on. Um, or like what code, all the things. Like, and I knew my parents were on the same team, especially for that Sunday. Mm. And if they won, it was, it was like all my troubles went away. Do you know what I mean? I do. And so, like, that's why I think sports is such an amazing connector um, because it it puts people on the same team and believing in the same thing. Mm -hmm. And I just brought my kids to their first Phillies game on Sunday, right? And it was so funny because then to be able to look at them and us then be cheering for the same team. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was funny because, of course, they wanted to see Bryce Harper play, but he wasn't playing, (laughs) right? Because we already... And so they got to see other people and they got to cheer. And it was just so great to have so many people, like, you know, to have that experience in my own family. In some odd way, it's like reliving some of those good, positive vibes that you felt as a kid to see your kids do that and kind of replicate that with the same team, the whole... Right, because that's the most special moments I have with my dad. Yeah. Is that, you know, my dad would take me to the Phillies game and it was the most memorable moments of my life Mm -hmm. is how I really connected with my dad over sports. And so it's really funny, though, because so um, uh, Mike Schmidt is a very famous Philly player and his autograph was hanging in my childhood house like the whole my whole life. And it was like, it's like still one of the most sacred things Mm -hmm. that you could ever have is this Mike Schmidt autograph. And it's just really funny because those are things that you'll always know about your parents. Mm -hmm. Do you know? Yeah. And so like, it's funny because when they talk, when my kids talk about me, like, and they talk about my favorite players, it's really funny because I'm like, oh my God, that's how I felt about my dad. You know what I mean? Like (laughs) my dad and his Mike Schmidt autograph, you know? Absolutely. And even with my mom, like as hard as we had it, and thank God my mom was able to... Uh, shake the whole uh, alcoholism uh, addiction that she had. She's now alive and well. We are well connected. Oh, she it's is amazing. Like 40, 45 years clean. Even though we went through a lot of different things in our lives, uh, we always said she's doing the best that she can. And right. I think even with sports, it's just like, listen, it's a way for us to, to bond and to realize you, know, you have players that get injured and they're like, I right. got to get back at that game. I got, And it's kind of like life too, right? Like with my mom, it's like she was in such a place of like, oh my gosh, you know. And even today, you know, we 
she doesn't want to talk about the the bad things. It's like I don't not. want to talk about the bad things. I want to talk right. about the good things. Right. Um. But the good things are like our dad used to do our hair. Our dad used to, you know, he and my mom had so much in common. They loved each other. We saw love. We felt love. Right. And um, I think that the connection. People are always looking for how they can be connected. I think that's so incredibly true. And I think that a lot of times, especially now in today's age, we spend time on our phone, we spend time on social media, all these things, and we think that connecting with people is liking their photo. Mm -mm. And it's not. Mm -mm. And what it can provide for people when they have those shared experiences together, that's really what can create change and create moments. We just read, um, as a staff, we just read the book called A Power of a Moment. And... um, it was recommended to me actually by, oh, actually my old uh, CrossFit gym owner. And it's probably one of the best books that I've read about what creating moments in your life, in your company, what it can do for people. Mm-hmm. Um, what has been your favorite moment with the Valley Vipers? Oh my gosh, there's so many. Oh my gosh, if I had to choose one. Oh my God, there's so many. That's such a hard question. I'm glad you asked it because now it's going to cause my wheels to turn. Right. And then you're going to, you're going to text me like two days later and you're going to be like, I wish I said that moment. No, but seriously, just give Um, me one or two. um, My favorite moment is, is seeing kids at the end of our games. And if you go on our highlight reels and things like that, you'll see what I'm, what I'm talking about on our, uh, on our um, Instagram page. But the guys literally do not go to the locker room after the games. I win, lose, Whatever is happening, it is about being here for our community too, right? So they go and they greet kids and they shake hands and they kiss babies and they, and so seeing that, just seeing them be connected to the community and the thing with sports too is that kids, our players are role models and kids look at people that are older than them and like oh wow they've made it to the next level of play oh they pursued their dream so I can pursue my dream too whether that's sports related or not like right. these guys become role models and to see kids just kind of come around them and like in awe of like whether they're a tall tall player or a not so tall tall player like just the connectivity of kids being like that's my favorite player. Like they, they, they designate their favorite players right. and they come and they support them and they're like, and it's not because they're the tallest or the fastest. It really is because they feel connected and they feel at reach. I know some um, times with the NBA games, you know, the players do their thing and they're like, all right, you know, on the bus to the next city, to the next town. Yeah. And we are accessible. Like after the games, we're so accessible. And I think if I had to choose one, if you're making me choose if one I'm moment, forcing you, yeah. it would be a recreatable moment uh, at the end of each of our games where we really feel connected with the community and being able to uh, to be there to serve as well, you know, with collecting food and other items that the, fam- the families need. And what else do you need from the Loudoun community to help Valley Vipers thrive? All right, we're at a big, big, big feat right now with the Kids Getting Free initiative. So you guys out there in the in the uh, internet world, um, you know, this will be a, a, one of our greatest feats, you know, because we are coming to a more dense population and because we want to definitely achieve our goal of getting kids in free um, and with our Kids Getting Free initiative, we're going to need sponsors. We're going to need some volunteers. Um, we we want to thank uh, United Charitable for stepping up and being our first Let's go. Uh, Kids Getting Free initiative uh, sponsor, but we, we know that uh, in order to meet our goal of kids getting in free all kids uh during the season uh we would need sponsorships uh and so if you would like to support our kids getting free initiative uh we'd love to have you if you are a kid or a family um that knows of anybody that wants to showcase their talents we have uh 12 home games and we want kids to come and sing the national anthem we're looking for talent we can do we have 15 minute timeout uh, um i'm sorry half times so we can showcase you know the the young kid that knows how to juggle or someone that knows how to do magic tricks what 
whatever that thing is, whatever that mojo is of, of kids, we want to kind of highlight um, them during our halftime. So if you guys know of anybody, uh, you know, we've got 12 home games and we'd love to be able to to do that. So um, what else do we need? Uh we need you to share, share, share on social media. We're trying to get up our followings and our likes. Not that that's the everything, but yeah. it does help us as we're... The awareness. The awareness piece is huge, being able to do that because we are expanding our market footprint. And where would we buy tickets? Like, how do we buy tickets? You will buy tickets online. And currently we have uh, courtside seats that are uh, we're going to be rolling out first. So we Ooh. have courtside seats. We just did yesterday, we did the whole plan for it. Um, if people are interested and they want to get courtside seats, they can reach out to me personally. Okay. Um, because we have all kinds of fun things that we can do, right? We have employees. Um, nights. We have all kinds of things that we can do for for corporations and people that want to yeah. have birthday parties. We have all kinds of things. So um, you guys can follow us on our uh, Instagram. You can also get information on our website at www.virginiavalleyvipers.com. Awesome. <laughs> well, Tina, thank you so much for being on the podcast today. I loved just hearing your story and just really being super inspired that, you know, you can really have it all. You can have it all and you can make change, but it also takes the vision and people, you know, it takes a team sometimes, you know, I, I wouldn't yeah. be able to do all the things that I do uh, with the organization without our team. But I love the inspired change maker uh, theme. And when I saw your podcast, I was like, oh my gosh, I totally believe in this. <laughs> I've got to, got to go on and meet Julia. And, um, so thank you for your time and thank you for believing in us. Absolutely. Thanks, Tina. You're welcome. Find Inspired Changemakers on Instagram, YouTube, and LinkedIn and comment on all the awesome things you are doing to make this world a better place. Don't forget to subscribe. Subscribe.